Our second speaker, Usman K. Power Green, is an associate professor in the Department of History and the director of the Africana Studies at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. He has published two books, Against Wind and Tide, The African-American Struggle Against the Colonization Movement in 2014, and recently co-edited In Search of Liberty, African-American Internationalism During the 19th Century with Ronald Johnson. In the fall 2022, the other press will publish his first novel, The Confessions of Matthew Strong, which allows, uh, which follows Ali Douglas, a black philosophy professor who foils a white supremacist plot orchestrated by Matthew Strong, a composite of various white supremacist idologues over the past century. His presentation today is based on over a decade of research into the ways white supremacist idologues distort history in order to legitimize their movements. His work has appeared in numerous journals, including, but not limited to, a special issue on Black America in the German journal on politics and contemporary history, critical studies and media communication, and Revue Française d'études américaines. He has received a number of honors and awards for his research, including the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Gilder Lehman Fellowship in American History. Additionally, Dr. Power Green has appeared on podcasts, radio, and television. Today, his presentation is titled Stop Killer Cop, Death to the Klan, Black Activists Fight Racism and Fascism in the 1970s. Thank you. Let's all welcome Dr. Power Green. Look at that. That was the smoothest my trip has been. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Mary Jane, and for the wonderful papers. Um, I think I should stand in front of the mic. This has been a true joy working on this project, but of course it, it has uh, pulled me from many other tasks that I have at, at Clark University. All the professors know, know what that's like. Um, so when I began thinking about this project, um, when I was asked to do the paper, it made me think about a lot of the work that I've been doing, thinking about white ideology, white supremacist ideology, and Black Americans struggle to, uh, to combat that. Um, and so in an ambitious moment, I chose to, to look specifically at the questions of police violence uh, as understood by Black activists in the 70s. Um, and my eyes were focused on the John Brown uh, Anti-Klan Committee. Um, and quickly, like, like most of us uh, who do historical research realize I started going down that rabbit hole. And next thing you know, I'm learning all sorts of new things. Um, but one of which I'm going to be able to, to sort of do as uh, Professor Murch mentioned and look more narrowly and specifically uh, at Black organizing in Eastern Correctional Facility in New York and really think about anti Klan activism in New York, a much neglected. Uh, topic, despite me scouring everywhere to find some more secondary sources on this, besides one great book. Um, but I wanted to start with the personal for a second. Last year, um, I was involved uh, with a, um, an, an edited collection on fascism. I was asked to write about Black uh, activism against fascism. And right around the time I was going to present, several things happened. One, the insurrection happened, literally like the day before, two days before. Uh, and second, my daughter's middle school was hit with this right up here. I don't know if people are aware of this, but white power organizations have been targeting even middle schools to attempt to challenge and upset and upend, uh, disrupt and to scare uh, children in communities like Northampton, Massachusetts, which I don't know if people have been to Northampton, but it considers itself the liberal bastion of Western Mass, at least, maybe New England. Um, but yet the elementary school uh, was targeted with, uh, with this sort of efforts to, 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 to intimidate the students around hate. Um, like everybody in here who, who 
you know, on some level recalls Charlottesville. Um, since then, but before then, I've been really engaged this question of history and memory, right? This contestation over history and memory, and then of course, counter memory, right? Which is uh, really important to black activists who, who I'm interested in. Um, the events at the White House, you know, particularly this image, which was so important to all of us historians um, to point out to our students, anyone who would listen, what it means to walk into the Capitol with the Confederate flag. Like, like, just like in terms of what people thought would ever happen, like this would not be one, right? It's such a major sort of moment. Um, but there were those before that event um, who spoke about this and that's where I'm gonna start uh, in terms of my paper, right? Near to home, but also one of the uh, true inspirations for me and most people who do the work uh, that I do looking at social movements. In the late 1960s, uh, Angela Davis and other black activists asserted that racism was a fundamental component of fascism and thus became an important framework to describe political policies and practices that impeded black people's struggle for racial justice and equality. Despite the terms origins in Europe, black activists used terms such as fascism and genocide to wake up the American public by identifying, publicizing, and demanding an end to policies they believe express fascist tendencies. As Davis argued, apologize for the long quote, but it's Angela Davis, so I need to make sure you get her whole vision here, okay? Okay, so this is what Davis writes, or says. Um, I have used the term fascism. I have talked about an increasingly fascist danger which people in this country must begin to come to grips with. Some people have accused me of using rhetoric which doesn't have any basis in reality. I think that we have to be very serious during these very critical moments. Oh yeah, by the way, this is on Democracy Now! 2016, when she gave this. I think that we have to be very serious during these critical moments. We have to understand that there is indeed a very real danger of fascism in the United States today. I do not think we have entered into a period of full-blown fascism because fascism is not something that suddenly explodes and erupts into being. If we look back into the history of the world, as we look at countries like Germany, Spain, Italy, we see fascism, we see that fascism is the process. It is something that grows and develops. It is something like cancer. It starts attacking one group of people, but like a cancer, it begins to spread out with a fatal rapidity and eventually, like a cancer, it destroys everything around it. Once fascism consolidates itself, I think again, we have to look towards the past uh, and look at those countries where fascism did develop into its full, full blown state. Once this happens, there's no possibility of resisting it and defeating it from within. Look what happened to Germany, look at Italy. It was always defeated from without. Central to Davis's claim is the erosion of core American constitutional protections for oppressed minorities, such as trial by jury or equal justice for the law. Though Davis claim uh, had been based or based her claims on her own personal experience being hunted, jailed, and put on trial to bolster her claim uh, about, prison, about prisons as a central component to American fascism. Now, when state troopers invaded Attica Correctional uh, Facility in upstate New York after inmates, after inmates took charge and demanded changes, she extended this fascist framework within the context of American actions such as imperialism abroad. For this time, the authorities, well, actually I should probably tell you real quick. So the demand, those who don't know about Attica, the Attica uprising, um, it's a very dramatic moment that led to, well, actually first let me talk about this. So inmates had these demands and I highlighted a couple, right? To show you where they were coming from through their action, right? So, you know, the, the analogy, fashion analogy or the description of concentration camps, these demands are being presented to you. There is no strike of any kind to protest these demands. We are trying to do this in a democratic fashion, right? So this petition went before, uh, before the insurrection. We feel there is no need to dramatize our demands, right? So, you know, this, you know, those that 
the, the study uh, uh, prison rights movements, you know, talk about the efforts before the event that happened. And so, which in this case uh, would lead to uh, a, a very violent uh, invasion, right? Which I want to talk about. So, uh, so for this time, the authorities uh, who who were the responsible for um, for sending in the state troopers um, were caught red-handed, according to Davis. They were publicly exposed. They were publicly exposed when to justify that massacre, a massacre which has which had led to. Uh, was, was led by Governor Rockefeller and agreed by the president. Davis believed that the invasion massacre and torture of inmates and after sort of the police come in and shoot these people and there's a series of like get stripping them naked and beating them and all sorts of stuff that fits exactly what Davis and others have been saying. Davis believed that the invasion massacre and torture of inmates quote was different from these other episodes in one very important respect. Nixon, when they hastened to falsify what had occurred, um, went and supported uh, the Rockefeller and others. These were not isolated aberrations, she wrote. They must be placed alongside Birmingham, Orangeburg, Jackson State, Kent State, Malay, Malay San Quentin, uh, and San Quentin. Taking my, my cue from Davis, several questions sort of drive this exploration into anti clan activism. Um, I'm curious about the way these activists used an anti-fascist framework that emphasized the genocidal nature of the U.S. government government's um, policies and practices, and the ways in which that shaped black power, the black power movements organizing in the 1970s. My paper considers the ways black anti-clan activism in, in Eastern Correctional Facility, and in, in, I knew I was going to stumble over this word, even though I practiced it. Napanak. Napanak, New York, never been there. Uh, inspired the white activists who joined the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee in the mid 70s to mobilize people against the Klan. Ultimately, this paper explores the contours of anti-Klan activism in the 70s within and outside prisons in New York, as I mentioned. So how did I arrive at this topic? Um, I was, my, so I'm gonna actually summarize this just in terms of time, but my sort of original work that I was interested in was uh, comparative violence in South Africa and the American South. And so I studied in graduate school under a professor that was doing that work. Um, and so that was sort of my formative experience from almost 20 years ago now. Um, and I've also been interested more recently in sort of the ways in which white power advocates distort history in order to galvanize supporters, right? As well as black activists attempts to counter such misreadings with evidence that, contra uh, that contradicts these racialist claims. My work is interested in the role of social movements play in educating the broader population about history and exposing the fallacies within popular national narratives that reinforce racial hierarchies and justify anti-democratic, anti-black policies and practices. So the questions at the heart of my research on white power organizations such as the Klan uh, have certainly been explored by many prominent scholars, some of whom I like Nancy McLean, who are here for decades. Um, Professor McLean, Linda Gordon, Steve Lay, and others um, have provided foundation upon which my history has been constructed. Also historians of the Black Power Movement, such as Heather Thompson and Donna Murch and Ashley Farm Farmer have provided crucial perspectives that move beyond narrow organizational histories to consider the monumental impact the Black Power Movement had on students, Prison, right act, prison rights activists, um, and also those sort of white activists who joined the anti, the John Brown anti clan organization. So in order to sort of sketch out the John Brown anti clan committee and sort of their role, I just wanted to talk a bit about what I found very interesting doing my research in the FBI papers. Um, one thing I noticed, and I need to like go back, this was like shocking to me, so maybe people bring this up, was that the FBI's attention on the Ku Klux Klan in the South in, the, in their papers they had ends in 65. I was like, yeah, like, it, it, like there's like a four, it's like 965. And then like that same year, this file on black extremists picks right up. So it's almost like an end on focus for the Klan in terms of counter Intel Pro, right? This organization and program it was focused on sort of undermining, you know, 
you know, as, as he saw it, extreme hate groups, et cetera. But I was fascinated by that sort of delineation. Um, and so while the Klan obviously was under tremendous attention by the FBI, it's interesting this pivoting towards black radicals uh, and seeing black radicals as described by J. Edgar Hoover as the greatest threat to America. All right. Now, within the context of, of Hoover's efforts uh, uh, to stifle black radicals um, all the way in, in, into the 70s, um, there was an emergence of a new clan. I want to talk a bit about the 70s clan. I'm going to go forward a little. Um, so in 1975, David Duke traveled the nation to reorganize the Ku Klux Klan. On television, utilizing television, his business suit, uh, and imagining a mass movement, um, which revised ideas he pulled from, from the group in the 20s, et cetera. David Duke's revised Klan proved successful. And from his first efforts in 1975 until 1979 about, Klan membership increased uh, from 6,000 to about 10,000, right? with another 75,000 who claimed sympathy with the Klan. That same year, the National Socialist Party of America, which is the neo-Nazi group, also pushed for mainstream respectability, having been a, a somewhat fragmented organization. The new push also included running for office uh, and, as I'm going to talk about, sort of working together with police. The KKK that I'm interested in studying during the 70s actually resembles, I was really going back looking at Linda Gordon's book and also um, Professor McLean's work, um, actually resembles the, the Klan of the 20s, um, who Linda Gordon calls, points out, um, deployed hyperbole and allegations of terrifying conspiracies to bring in more members and describe themselves as part of a team committed to reducing the country from its internal enemies. Like that Klan, um, the Klan in the 70s saw itself as becoming a social movement that expressed the politics of resentment among those who believed elites from New York or, or Chicago, among others uh, who represented money interests, uh, were involved in some sort of conspiracy. Skip down. By the late 70s and early 80s, the KKK and neo-Nazi groups came together in ways that illustrated uh, the two very roots, uh, very different roots, uh, one post-war post South and the other, the Nazi party in Germany, um, both which are centered on white supremacy. Soon KKK leaders like Glenn Miller wore camouflage and used the Nazi salute uh, in his repertoire. While, the Georgia, uh, while Georgia's rabid anti-Semite Ed Fields recruited Klansmen and Nazis into his National States Rights Party. The conflation of Nazi and Klan with states' rights confederates uh, inspired, inspired leaders and other people and became an important uh, or a potent tool even in recruiting youth. All right. So I just want to skip over and talk about these youth who they were recruiting and focus specifically on New York State. I know this may be simple. I just decided to put a map in New York State up for everybody because we're talking about a place that many people don't go to in New York State. Um, I grew up in West Chester. So I was born in Harlem. And so I grew up... Oh, this is so cool. I've never used this before. Um, I always wanted to use it though. So I, I was born in Harlem, but I grew up in Westchester. Yeah. And so we're going to be talking about Ulster County, Orange County, Sullivan County, right? Um, and Ulster County specifically, again, this is where Eastern Correctional Facility is located. All right. So let's go forward and talk about this other concept for a second. All right, so I'm skipping a lot just because I want to really make sure we have time for this. Okay, prison organizing at Eastern, so this is anti clan activism in prison. So, prison organizing at Eastern State Penitentiary in Napanak, Napanak, I just can't get Napanak, Napanak, New York, began shortly after the Attica uprising. Kali Hordery led a contingent of Black and Third World inmates at Eastern Correctional Facility. Um, to join the fight against the Klan. For years, so this is a, just to sort of give you sort of context, which we could obviously get a lot more into, um, but this is an example from a Klan burning in 1975 in Binghamton, New York, right? So upstate, upstate New York. Um, and this is a series of sort of like newspaper clippings of like, you know, 
of various examples of the Klan in New York uh, that emerged. And this is one of the pictures on like the history of Eastern Correctional Facility that I thought I'd show you, right? Pretty interesting. Um, so this is uh, Kali Hordery on the left right here with that, with that image. Um, and this is the sort of literature that came out among prison rights activists that attempted to chronicle all the different examples of either actions or uh, you know, white supremacist actions or other or actual organizing that took place um, among those who were incarcerated. Now, what's interesting about Eastern Correctional Facility is that um, Hordery and other members actually organized an NAACP chapter, <laughs> which is interesting because one wouldn't consider like a black power organization, the NAACP, right? And so, but they, he organizes it um, in an effort to get legitimacy and also to think about the important role that attorneys can play, right? In attempting to actually get rights for them uh, in Eastern Penitentiary and specifically to, to expose the Klan in Eastern Cor Correctional Facility. So some of the sort of tactics they would do, oh, I had that ticket. Oh, it's over here. So, so if you see this over here, this is like their, their thing, which they talk about the client lot. But one of the texts they would do was try to expose guards who they believe were, affi were affiliated with the Klan, which I think is actually really interesting, like trying to go back and find out if it's true or not, right? You know, doing historical work. Um, but the point was, you know, it, you know, whether or not people were card carrying members or not wasn't their point, right? their efforts were to, to use whatever power they could to exploit and expose people that did anything and behaved in ways they viewed as white supremacists. Now, they were also able to get other organizations in Eastern uh, to rally behind their cause, right? And one is an example of this organization, the People's Party Marxist group, right? Uh, writing this and talking about not only anti-Klan violence, but also the sort of broader ways in which fascism, genocide, racism function together alongside of that. Got it. Now, one of their great accomplishments uh, is to expose this gentleman, attempt to expose this gentleman right here, Ed Shoemaker, um, who's the Grand Dragon of the Klan in, from Pine Blush, New York, which is nearby, uh, and also as an inmate. Right? And so the goal uh, of Klan organizing in prisons is constantly to say like, this isn't like an analogy. This isn't like, this is like a literal, right? So you talk about, you know, police, you talk about prison guards, they are one and the same in terms of with the Klan, right? And so um, yet in this era, and this is what's so interesting about uh, this sort of mass mobilizing. On one hand, there's this like effort to mass mobilize. I, I talked about the David Duke represents, but on the other hand, people like Shoemaker are working sort of as like a vanguard or like are sort of, you know, are not trying to publicize themselves. And so that even though they literally have like a nonprofit you know, status, um, but they're really not interested in getting much publicity, but, but enjoying that sort of secret society aspect. Now, the more formal organization that ends up being the vehicle to promote right, the work by black activists and Latino activists, and other activists in prisons ends up being the John Brown anti-Klan committee, right? So they're out, you know, they're, you know, spread throughout. The branch that I was interested in looking at was in Stuyvesant in New York City um, and the organizing of the John Brown committees there. But what I want to call attention to, which is super interesting in this, in this one issue, um, a later issue, they're established in like 75, 76, it's hard to get the date of when they were established, by the way, you know, it's like, or where, um, but anyway, that's for, for later research. Um, but the Yankee clan, see that? The clan in Connecticut, right? So there really is an effort among the New York John Brown, you know, based in, in New York City Stuyvesant Station to expose the Ku Klux Klan in the North, right? In New England, in New York, and, and to spread that throughout the nation to, to move away from this like Southern paradigm, right? And then of course, um, right, this idea of constantly using police shootings and trying to expose them. Uh, and they sound exactly like the police shootings we hear today. Um, uh, and so it's super interesting. That part. Now, don't need to get into to why they call themselves the John Brown Committee, but just in case there are those who aren't aware of John Brown, right? 
John Brown supersedes his sort of, or, or stretches beyond his role, um, leading those to attempt uh, to create an insurrection in the South in 1859, to this sort of image of John Brown, very popular image of him in people's imagination, right? And so thinking about the association and the effort of the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee to use that tag John Brown speaks to John Brown's effort to organize with Black Americans, for example, right? John Brown's idea that one needs to meet violence with violence, and that's what it takes, one must be willing to go all the way. So when, when the organizers who, again, it's mostly sort of white left organization, say John Brown, they're saying we're down to take it as far as it needs to go, right? Fighting against Klan violence and killer cops as they constantly talk about. All right, because I got the five minute mark, like three minutes, 30 seconds ago. I'll, I'll sort of wrap up here. Um, and I guess I'll wrap up by just talking about three initiatives that I found fascinating that they're involved in, right? So one is pretty obvious in their, in their periodical, in their, in their, their newspaper uh, is like sort of this. So examples of Free the Pontiac Brothers or various examples of people who they consider political prisoners who are around. So there's that sort of aspect, right? Prison organizing um, and also, you know, sort of you know, free different groups they feel were incarcerated legally. Um, the other has to do with sort of promoting efforts to deal with this other idea of genocide, right? Um, among activists uh, and, and who are specifically imagining the intentionality of drugs, poverty, right, institutional racism, as it's called, trying to promote different uh, mobilizations and movements. And this, this uh, article talks about uh, this specific uh, uh, form that was going to take place and then publicizing this form. And it says, uh, you know, on, on November 9th, 1939, uh, the forum War in America, the struggle to free the land was held in New York City, right? And so I sort of talk about the different groups of black activists that are doing that. Um, and the last one are, are stuff like this, right? The Brownstone Movement and the Ku Klux Klan, right? And so it's tempting to utilize examples of racism uh, in New York City, uh, you know, in order to ultimately help people realize the fight is much bigger than the Klan. Thank you, right? The fight extends these other aspects. And that is actually my last slide, right? Which is the constant effort to reference the Civil War, history, memory in the struggle uh, to fight against the Klan and fight against broader examples of, uh, of, of, of racism and injustice. So with that, I will stop there. Thank you all for your attention.